Hello and very warm welcome to the Horizon Interview 60 Minute to Big Questions about the big stories from the news and beyond with fresh insight and critical analysis. I am Christian Ogodo and we're live in Nigeria's capital, Abuja. Coming up in the next hour, the controversy in the Niger Delta Development Commission took another turn as the acting managing director of the commission and his team walked out on legislators investigating the alleged 40 billion naira irregular expenditure in the commission. On the same day, the leadership of the National Assembly met with President Muhammadu Buhari and the president warned ministers and heads of government agencies not to disrespect or undermine the National Assembly. He also called for a speedy and coordinated investigation into the alleged mismanagement of resources for the development of the Niger Delta region. Today, we'll take a look at the unfolding drama in the NDDC, coming up in a moment. There was another drama at the National Assembly as Kem Kemebra Dikumo Pondei, a professor and acting managing director of the Niger Delta Development Commission, NDDC, walked out on the House of Representatives panel investigating the commission. At the meeting of the House Committee on NDDC, Pondel stormed out of the session after insisting that Olubumi Tunjiojo, its chairman, will not preside. He said Tunji Ojo had been accused in the alleged fraud at the end of the say and so cannot sit over the same matter in which he is an accused. His action urged members of the committee which issued an arrest warrant against the NDDC acting MD and other members of the interim management committee. Let me just um, say that we are not comfortable with the chairman of this committee presiding over a, met a matter in which he is an accused party. The NDDC has over the time accused the Honorable Olubumi Tunji Ojo of different crimes against the NDDC and its people, and he has responded in press is an interested party and we do not believe that uh, the NDDC can have justice because he cannot sit in his own case. And we have no issues with appearing uh, before chairman, committees chairman, because we have order. appeared before point of order, the Senate point of order. ad hoc committee. Point of order, and as long as he is the chairman of this committee, the NDDC chairman, will not chairman. make any presentations here. There is no point of order here, please. I'm just stating our stand here before we start. <laughs> well, I think I was even taken aback there because in parliamentary parlance, there must always be point of order. But meanwhile, at the public hearing today, more revelations again were unfolded. Clap on communication transferred money to Charles of Dilly's account. Union Bank of Nigeria account number 0030066266. To Charles Odili. Charles Odili. Who is yes. Charles Odili? The staff of the commission. I think he's the director of medical corporate affairs or so. He transferred on the 25th of, 25th of uh, March. Remember, I said 24 24th of March, clear point was paid. So he got money on the 25th of March. They got another money on the 21st of uh, May. Can you say the figures, please? I don't have it here, sir. 20, uh, 21st of May, 2105, he got another payment. This time around, twice. One of these should be 5 million naira on this 2105. One of the figures should be 5 million. And in fact, not should be please 5 please million naira. Sir? All right, sir. The 24.05, he got 24.05. Three days later, he got another transfer from the same company. The 25.05, he got another transfer from the same company. 26.05, he got another transfer from the same company. The amount ranges between one and five million naira, et cetera. But the ones I have here, I have mentioned. And I put it to them, sir, if they dare deny, I will smoke them. 
Perhaps I'd like to just remind you that the president had written a letter to the National Assembly appointing the forensic and suspending the appointment of the board, the Bernard of Magbaneko. And in that letter, which I've also, you have it anyway, um, the president said that he was appointing the IMC to supervise the forensic audit. That was the reason that he was bringing in the, um, the IMC. Now, what happened, what I meant wasn't exactly what was going on. The minister, uh, the minister Akabim, insisted that he will supervise the forensic audit. I reminded him and showed him the letter that the president had written. There's no way that we can send the money that is in our budget, number one. He requested that the president, in his memo to the president, he requested that the money for the funding of the forensic audit be gotten from the service white books. Mr. President, in his wisdom, refused that request and in writing said that it should be from the NDDC um, um, appropriation. It should be put in the NDDC budget. Therefore, making NDDC the procuring entity. Okay, for more on these, I'm now being joined by Honorable Benjamin Kalu. He's the spokesperson of the House of Representatives and also a member of the House Committee on NDDC that is uh, carrying out this investigation. And also from our off-site uh, studio, we have Dr. Emeka Okengu, a development economist. Gentlemen, very warm welcome to the Arise interview. But I'm going to start first with the spokesman of the House of uh, Representatives, uh, Benjamin Kalu. The acting MD of the NDDC, uh, Professor Ponde, has raised very serious allegations against the chairman of the House Committee on NDDC, Honorable Olubumi Tunji Ojo. Do you think it is morally right for Tunji Ojo to still sit in a case and be a judge advocate. Thank you very much for <clears throat> inviting me. This is always a platform for us to engage with the public. I thank this uh, station and I encourage other station to afford the parliament this opportunity to engage. Your question that a serious allegation was raised, I beg to differ. With the, with the acting MD no, of that, NDDC, that, not me. No, yeah, there was no, there was no serious allegation. Frivolous, very frivolous, you know, allegation. The I MD, said so. The MD said some I, of the contracts yeah, were uh, awarded to Olubumi, I mean, Tunji Ojo. He was categorical. I, I he didn't had, talk from both I sides had, of the I had you clearly. And Great. You should give me time to address that. Okay. I'm saying... It was a frivolous statement because he was given notice over 90 days. And he said Tunji uh, Ojo responded to the allegation by commenting over the press, social media. What Tunji Ojo said was, I am available for investigation. If you have anything against me, approach the police, approach the DSS, approach EFCC any of the agencies, you have the liberty to approach them. Approach the ethics committee of the house. Approach the leadership of the house. If you like, submit your petition before the public petition committee of the house. Those were windows that were open that the legislative arm uses for issues like this, to address issues like this. If you fail to make use of those windows, and then you come. You know, the law says equity aids the vigilant, not the indolent. If you have these opportunities to address your concern and you fail to do that, and you believe that by coming to the invitation, of, uh, to attend to the invitation of the parliament, and that if you just declare that this man is a criminal, that it was sufficient or adequate enough 
for the House to now depend on you in the conduct of their proceeding as against Section 60 of the Constitution that made it very clear that the House regulates its activities. The activities of the House is regulated, is self-regulatory. You cannot come and tell us who is fit enough to sit as the chairman of the committee or who should sit in a committee or how we run our hearing. Recently, I've seen people saying, you cannot bring camera or camera should be here before I speak. You don't tell the parliament how to run the affairs of, it is in the constitution, it's not even a house rule. So if we gave him an opportunity in line with the principle of fair hearing to come and explain what is before us, allegations that have been sent to us, petitions, numerous petitions that have been sent before the parliament, which section 88 and 89 of the constitution has given us the commission, the solid mandate to address, and you fail to make use of this particular fair hearing opportunity. You have no one to blame. You cannot come to the house and tell us, do it this way. If you don't do it this way, I'm taking a walk. Remember, during the eighth assembly, a seventh assembly, a similar thing took place where my own sister from my constituency, a reputable Aruma, uh, Aruma Ote, Ote of the SEC, came and had something that had to do with an infraction, so alleged. By, by the chairman. By the uh, chairman Hembe of the Hembe. Of Thank you. I'm yeah. happy you know that. Sure. She raised the issue and said, Hembe, there's an infraction. You cannot be a judge in this. You know what the Hembe did? did? What he did was to say, uh, the security agencies, you are here. Um, there's an allegation against me. You are free to investigate me when you want to. But for now, the business of this house must continue. And he hid the gavel. That was in line with the principle of the Constitution, the provisions of the Constitution, and the rules of our house. What did Arumote do? She did not walk out of the house. She did not take a walk out of the institution. She stayed there. And she gave her own side of the story. The question is, what is NDDC, IMC hiding? Why is it, why are they more focused in this strategic move to distract Nigerians from pursuing the substance and shifting their focus to shadows? We are not interested in the shadows. All we are saying is, I had you mention 40 billion, but I want to tell Nigerians that it's not 40 billion. We're talking about 81.5 billion, not 40 billion. 81.5 billion was used between January and May, five months. And this is taxpayers' money. And you have given us the mandate when you elected us to follow the money that we appropriate. Recently, we were called robust stamp. We've been called that we do the bid of the executive. But now we are saying it is high time we got the job done. Show us where the money was spent. In five months, 81.5 billion. And I, I believe, Nigerians, this, is, was, what, this was the reason you elected us. And I think we should be allowed to carry out the mandate you have given to us without any further distraction, with all these frivolous accusations. Because if we allow that to take place, well. it will become a wrong precedent. That any time you invite the MDAs to come for us to carry out our oversight function, somebody will throw up, you are a criminal, leave the house. Okay, thank you very much, Chair Honorable Benjamin Kalu. We want to take some messages. When we come back, we'll be interrogating further the developing stories from the Niger Delta Development Commission and the region at large. You're still watching the Arise interview. We're going on a short break. Do stay with us. You welcome back to the Rise interview with me, Christian Oglowo, live in Nigeria's capital, Abuja. President Muhammadu Buhari has directed a speedy and coordinated investigation into the alleged mismanagement of resources for the development of the Niger Delta region. He met with the leadership of the National Assembly and reacted to the unfolding drama of attacks and counterattacks between persons and institutions involved in the investigation. President Buhari expressed his strong determination to get to the root of the problem, undermining the development of the Niger Delta, despite the enormous resources invested in the region. 
The president asked security and investigating agencies to collaborate with the National Assembly to resolve the challenges in the NDDC. He called for speedy action on the matter to assist government in unraveling the wrongs committed by the managers in order to correct them. The president pledged this administration's commitment to bring rapid and sustainable development to the Niger Delta region. We we'll would do to ensure that uh, the administration work for, for Nigerians. We we'll would do that. And this is to enhance the, uh, the relationship between the legislature and the executive to commit ourselves to ensuring that we work together. Here, I mean, both the legislature and the executive must at all times work in the interest of the people of this country. We cannot afford uh, not to do this because essentially government is for people uh, to have service and the, 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 the essence of this particular uh, visit is to ensure that the legislature, the National Assembly and the executive arm of government led by Mr. President uh, continues to work uh, together to ensure that the relationship that we have which has been working for, uh, for, this, uh, for this administration to deliver services to Nigerians is sustained. As the leadership of the National Assembly who visited President Mamadou Buhari yesterday at the presidential villa. Okay, I still have with me in the studio here, Honorable Benjamin Kalu, who is the spokesman of the House of Representatives and in our offside studio, as a development economist, Dr. Emeka Okengu, um, let me again come to you, uh, Honorable Benjamin. You said 81 billion naira, it's been uncovered that 81 billion naira was spent by the NDDC between January and May. Yep. How was it spent and was it appropriated for by the National Assembly? Thank you very much. Um, the first part of your question is, how was it uncovered? We, we have um, the CBN present yesterday, or day before yesterday, during the hearing. No, it was yesterday. No, the first day of the hearing was the day before yesterday. I'm sorry about that. And also we had the Auditor General who was there. The Accountant General was represented. The Director General of the Bureau of Public Procurement so these are major stakeholders when it comes to um, spending in the country. Government money. And there was a, corrob um, a corroboration between these agencies that these amount of money went out of the government's paws. The CBN confirmed, what the Auditor General confirmed, and the Counter General confirmed. Now, the next part of your question, was it budgeted for? Most of these funds were extra budgetary expenses because you saw how we struggled with 2019 budget because the performance report of the 2018 took forever to get the National Assembly to enable us to pass it. And when we did, that particular budget ended 31st of May. And the 2020 budget, we're still struggling with them. They ask for more time for them to present the performance report of what they did in 2019. So to answer your question, most of that money, they were not part of the budget. They even spend money that is yet to be appropriated. Isn't, for, that, isn't for, that illegal? Very, very. For example, an issue of forensic auditing that everybody has been talking about, you know, when they presented their budget, we saw that there was no budget line, no budget head that had forensic auditing, even though the president had issued a directive that the forensic auditing was necessary. He meant well. But when we saw it was not there, the wisdom of the leadership of the House and that of the committee made us include it, and we appropriated fund for it. But you know how it works. You still have to get, go through BP, uh, uh, Bureau of Public Procurement and all the processes for
for it to come out. And also, in going through forensic auditing, there's a provision in the Constitution that needed to be complied with with regards to the role that, that will be played by the Auditor General of the Federation. And Section 86 of the Constitution co captured that. If you read down the paragraphs, you will see where it clearly stated that it is the role of the Auditor General to provide a list of external auditors to institutions like the agencies and the commissions who will do the auditing. And it is the role of the agency to choose from that list of qualified, pre-qualified auditors. Was that complied with? No. On also scale of fees, it is the role of the Auditor General to also provide a scale of fees to be followed in paying these people. I don't want to go into the investigation that is going on now because just like you say, the matter is sub judice if it is before the court. Uh, there is nothing like uh, sub -judices. I would have said we are not supposed to comment on it. But let me scratch the surface. Scratching the surface means that revelations have shown that the people that got selected, nine of them, to run this forensic auditing, they don't meet the criteria, the qualification to run forensic auditing. The law says that they must have done forensic auditing in the last three years. Some of them are uh, shoemakers. Some of them are uh, shop feeders. Some of them are road construction workers. Some of them are unknown names. We know local auditing firms that are credible. Not, not the, certified by ICANN and uh, the question, Anand, the, the, the question, the, the question so, becomes, why did we not choose the best out of the country for such serious service that the president called for? It, it's a question for the ND, NDDC to answer. Well, it will still be a question uh, for you as a spokesman no of worries. the House of Reps to, to answer. No Let's uh, cross over to our offsite studio where we have Dr. Emeka Okengu, the development economist. Uh, Dr. Emeka, if you look at the Niger Delta, it seems a very troubled region. But can rapid and sustainable development uh, be possible in the Niger Delta when you find this kind of allegation of squander mania, 81 billion in five months? Uh, thank you very much. I, I think in taking the Niger Delta, you must take it in its whole totality. Uh, you're just talking about maybe one or two states or one particular state in the Niger Delta. Don't also forget that we have nine states that comprise the Niger Delta ranging from Abia to Imo to Ondo, uh, now to the six uh, core states you have in the South South region. So it is not about the Niger Delta being in total turbulence. But to get to your question directly, you're talking about development. And development is a function of plans. Okay, development is a function of actions. Development is a function of programs. Now, if you're not able to put these three things together, you might not be able to now have a master fit. Uh, let's start with the master plan that was supposed to be developing the Niger Delta region. There were some demands to that master plan, if you remember. Uh, one of it is that uh, the allocations to the region uh, was supposed to be you know, moved up to 25% with a final target of 50%. Uh, we're supposed to be looking at now committing to ending gas flaring. We're also supposed to be committing to what they call the DDR, which is actually in the center of most of the things that uh, the NDDC and these other pseudo agencies, you know, that are supposed to be operating the region now operate on. And that DDR means disarmament, decommissioning, and their reintegration. And for each aspect of this, there were supposed to be some infrastructure demands that were supposed to be going by it. So to answer your question in a Dr. very... Dr. Emeka, uh, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, let me just put you on hold here. We want to take some messages. When we return, we'll come back to you to expatiate further on your thoughts. You're still watching the Arise interview. We've got plenty more still ahead. Stay with us. You're welcome back to the Arise interview. I still have with me uh, Honorable Benjamin Kalu, is the spokesman of the House Committee uh, on the House of Representatives and a member of the Committee on the Niger Delta Development Commission. 
And in our offside studio, Dr. Emeka Okengu, a development economist, is still there with us. But let me quickly, before I come to you again, Dr. Emeka, let me turn to uh, Honorable Benjamin. At today's hearing, uh, one of uh, your principal uh, witnesses, I would say, uh, Joy Nune, revealed that there is no forensic audit or auditing ongoing in the NDDC. Is, you want to expatiate on that? Yes. Um, what the investigation is showing is that uh, the mandate that was given to the IMC when they came into place 29th of October 2019 uh, was for them to get this done within six months. And uh, your guess is good as mine. If you count from October to now, how many months that has passed? The, the, our worry is that it has not even commenced. You know, we are not even talking about finishing it. It has not even commenced. And the evidence is there. It was just in May recently that they went to obtain uh, approval from the president. Uh, for FEC, uh, FEC, FEC, to give them approval to uh, you know, procure these uh, services of uh, forensic auditing. And they got um, the BP, BPP, that is the Bureau of Public Procurement, to give them certificate of no objection, which we question. Because in granting the certificate of no objection, uh, you are supposed to declare where the source of the money that is going to fund that particular service is going to come from. It was given in error because it's supposed to be hinged on the budget. And in this time... There's no budget. There's no budget. Because the 2019 budget ended 31st of May, and we are now talking about 2020 budget, which they have found very difficult to defend before they have. So how did the budget get to the National Assembly? Because I know the budgeting process for an intervention agency like the NDDC mm -hmm. comes direct from Mr. President. It shouldn't come from the NDDC. It, it, the budget that we have presented to us came from NDDC. We, we don't tell the executive how to do their job. Our job is to receive what is sent to us from the executive. If it is at the discretion of Mr. President who has appointed the minister of Niger Delta, uh, who actually got one function, because Nigerians need to hear this, that the, the mandate given to the minister is not to run the whole nine yards of the function of the president with regards to that agency. Is it just one function, which is supervisory function. So if the president within that supervisory function allowed the minister with the NDDC to make presentation of the budget, we are not questioning that procedure. The issue is that, was any budget led before us? Yes, but the, and the, the, the next question is, when you lay a budget, you need to tell us, before we pass the budget, how you perform with the previous budget. We need to know if you, you did what the other budget said, because it's a law. The budget is a law. It's an act of parliament. So we need to benchmark what you, have bringing, what you are bringing to us against what we have given to you. For example, if we appropriated money for you to build road one, two, three, under one year, for an amount of 100 million, and you are coming back to present road one, two, three, for 100 million, we will ask you what happened to the first 100 million that we gave you in 2019. That is where they are struggling with. And that was why when they appeared before the joint committee of the Senate and the House of Representatives, the, their numbers that we are not telling. The explanation they gave, you know, using the appendix was not telling with the figures they gave. We asked them, okay, you are on oath. Can you sign off this document? They said, no, we cannot sign it off. Give us time for us to go and prepare the performance report and come back. So NDDC is the one holding the passage of the 2020 budget. And you can see, we're already in June, July. And 2020 budget of NDDC has not been passed. Remember, that is not the fault of Mr. President. Because most people from Niger Delta, where I come from, 
might be thinking that the region is forgotten by the president. That is not the issue. The Mr. President mean well. Mr. President started with the National Assembly and urged us for a collaboration that will help him develop Nigeria better. And that was why the passage of the budget of the Federal Republic of Nigeria came, you know, at the right time. We changed the calendar, you know. So if we have achieved that with the national budget, the regional budget for the agency should not be something that will not be able to pass. It really should, have, yeah, yeah, it should, should not be, be difficult. Yes. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Benjamin. Let's uh, return to the offside studio and let me ask uh, Dr. Emeka. Dr. Emeka, you've heard some of the submissions of the House of Reps uh, spokesman. 81.5 billion naira in five months. Should the IMC, the Inter Interim Management Committee, really be running the NDC, the NDDC, you know, uh, on a daily basis, day-to-day -day activities, since the mandate is go and carry out a forensic audit there? Has it not created this uh, kind of uh, various allegations and squandermania that we're seeing? No, I think what has happened, that was where I was actually trying to go with my argument. Uh, uh, is, is, is failures of what we call development planning. Okay, I was trying to break development into its major three strands. Now you have what we call physical infrastructure, you have what we call human capital development, and then you have what we call policy oversight. Now, if you don't have these three things working together, you're going to be having you know, the challenge that you're facing now. Uh, let me, let me commend the House of Representatives, commend the National Assembly. I think we're beginning to see uh, a, a Nigeria that can function, okay? Because in now carrying out this oversight, I think it has to be deepened to the point of also now investigating, okay, the disalignment, if you may, or the disaggregation between your development of human capital or your plans of development, of, which is central, to developing the Niger Delta region, and then the development of your physical infrastructure, which actually, and again, has two strands, what you call your social infrastructure and where you can have your critical infrastructure. So if you don't have this understanding of these three issues, you're going to be having, uh, uh, like somebody had said sometime in the past, that even if you bring the holy men to run the economy of Nigeria, it was going to be collapsing. So I don't think the problem is the management. As, as a management. I think the problem is the framework, okay, that the management or, under, operates under. You are looking at it, you know, from a framework point of view. But let me return to you, Benjamin. Is it all these revelations, I mean, uh, in the public uh, hearing by the NDDC, is it a matter of framework creating the NDDC, the NDDC, the act is very clear. But some people say these overlapping uh, functions now by the IMC, whose tenure is supposed to be six months. And just like you noted, this is uh, about 10 months into their tenure. I, to an extent, you know, our problem is not law. It's not, it's not legal framework. It's, it's not, we have good laws in this country. I have, I'm a lawyer by training, and I've taken time to study some of the laws we have, some of the establishment arts that we have in the Federal Republic of Nigeria. And I can assure you, we have beautiful laws. The problem is the political will to put these laws into action. The willingness to do what is right. Why Nigerians, and I commend my, my colleague, you know, who just spoke now, the development expert, who said, that he's seen a new kind of parliament. That, is the, that was the desire of the leadership of this house when we came on board. We said joint task for nation building. Why Nigerians are seeing this agitation and manipulation and all these distractions, strategic distraction, you know, coming from the uh, ministry and also the IMC, is because we refuse to be bought. If we had accepted to be bought, we would not be doing this oversight function. You say there is there has been an attempt to, of course, to buy members well, of, of the course, National Assembly. Of course, the National Assembly is always, you know, pressured by different interests to make sure we don't carry out Section 88 and 89 with regards to our oversight functions.
And when we do that, things don't work well. And when things don't work well, guess who they punish? The president. He is not performing. He is not doing well. But he means well, and he wants this country to function. That was why I was in a meeting with him and other people where he said, I want a collaboration that will enhance the development of this country. But if you, and some of these people who are heading these agencies, they were not there when he was laboring to maintain this collaboration. Remember that we are collaborating does not mean that we are a doormat for the executive. We will never be doormat. If we are doormat, we will not be oversighting them the way we are doing at the moment. We are carrying our function, but in dignity, without being rascals. We are trying to eliminate rascality in governance. Get the job done without insulting the president. Get the job done without insulting the executive. And that is why we also call the executive, watch the people who are trying to bring bad blood in this relationship, where rascality will be introduced in the relationship. And I thank God that Mr. President, in his wisdom, stood up yesterday and read the riot act. I don't want this from anybody I have appointed in government. And see what it's going to do. It is going to increase the impetus of the legislative arm, who are in partnership with the executive arm for national development. But when you ridicule the legislative arm, you are ridiculing the Mr. President and the executive. Because though we are three arms of government, we are one government. If you ridicule the judiciary, you are ridiculing the executive. Because when the executive carry their function and the judiciary supposed to be there to interpret and make sure that those who are supposed to be punished are punished, and you ridicule the judiciary, the president and the executive will be stopped. The same is applicable here. So we want this symbiotic relationship. We don't want parasitic relationship between us and other arms of government. We dance towards you, you dance towards us. You know, it is a symbiotic relationship that we long for. And who benefits? Is the country. Who suffers when two elephants fight? It is the country. Hmm. Yeah, and the fight is uh, really getting messy. Now, uh, very quickly to our side studio, and uh, let's talk to Dr. Emeka. Dr. Emeka, uh, during uh, today's uh, interrogation and investigation, the former acting managing director of the NDDC, Joy Nunye, revealed that human uh, capital development in the NDDC is nothing to write home about. Specifically, she said the NDDC has not more than 10 qualified engineers. Isn't that uh, a very curious a situation in such an interventionist agency? It's not curious. What it is, is that, that is what the matter is. Like, remember I told you that there are three aspects to development. Uh, one is that you must look at the human capital, and it's central to the development of a Niger Delta region. Two, of course, is your social infrastructure, and it is different from your critical infrastructure. They might both be physical. Okay? Now, I think what the matter is with the revelations that are coming from the NDDC, you know, I think what I expect, you know, is a lot of resignations. I think what I expect is a lot of suspensions because uh, integrities have been called to question. We are no longer talking about a, a fraud or a crime here. Yeah, we're talking about integrity and trust, okay? And I think, you know, from what uh, the honorable member who sat in the who have papers that I've looked at is saying, and he's being very emphatic, you know, on national television, and he's making pronouncements that are very far-reaching. I think that the way to get about this is that, uh, that suspending them, you know, does not stop them from coming to answer, you know, for uh -huh. give account of uh, public uh, funds or public trust. Uh, all right, all right, Dr. Emeke, I'll uh, you know, give you... Them. I'll give you more opportunity. Sorry to, you know, uh, cut in there. We want to take some messages again. And when we return, uh, we'll look uh, at that uh, in uh, more in-depth. You're still watching the Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview. Let's uh, quickly go back to the offsite studio and allow Dr. Emeka uh, Okengu to complete his thoughts on uh, the issue of human capital development very quickly. And while you're doing that, I would also want you to look at the call by Joy Nunye, uh, the former acting managing director of the NDDC, where she said it is now very important that the country establish a national procurement council. And I, my question is, can this really be a panacea to stopping fraud? 
Yes, it will be. It will be a panacea. It would. It would help. It would help uh, getting a sense. Remember that that was even one of the things that Mr. President had uh, promised that he was going to do. That he was going to be central. The centralizing procurement. But I really don't think it's all about procurement, uh, uh, my brother. I think it goes beyond procurement. I think it has to do with development planning and what you call your development milestoning. Okay, and this is where the National Assembly can actually do much more than they're doing. Uh, you don't wait for, for the fire to start and then you start looking for something to put it off because by the time you even successfully put it off, a lot of damage has been done. And this has been the bane of a lot of intervention agencies that we have in Nigeria. I think where we are missing it is that we are not able to develop what you might be able to call, you know, timelines, okay, and stages where things now graduate from probably step one up to the last step. Okay, where you now have what you call rollover or incremental development or incremental, you know, project development. This is where I think we are missing it. Uh, the MD had said, had made a lot of revelations, of course, as expected. Uh, and I don't even think it's only about just the end. It, it has so, every other agency might also have that problem. And it has to do principally with what we do with our procurement act. I mean, the, the, the spokesman there with you has said that a BPE or BPP had given, you know, a no objection uh, order, you know, wrongly or something. I, 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 I'm, I'm trying to paraphrase. Now, if it was wrongly issued, then there has to be some punishment. You know, do you understand what I'm saying? So, so that you, we need to begin to do things properly. If everything that was supposed to have happened, happened, was there a pre-audit? Okay, was that document preaudited? How do we now actually issue these no objections? What and what are required for you to be able to issue a no objection? Because what it simply means is that for you to get a no objection to carry out a project, you had done, you know, what you call your back end, you know, leading up to your, 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 your front end of that project. So you're right. A, a central procurement system would work, but a central system would also be challenged if you don't also do the back end properly to make certain that at every point of the way, you know, in disbursing public funds, you are disbursing it based across the three lines I've talked about. One, how does it capture your human capital? Two, how does it now capture the real essence of social infrastructure? Then three, how does it now, you know, affect the common good of everybody? And then, does it have a monitoring and evaluation framework? Okay. I've, okay. I've, I've been waiting for somebody to talk about, you know, oversighting the monitoring and evaluation framework. I, I've not seen anybody say that. I, I, because I, these are all the <laughs> instruments that should have led yeah. to that no objection to have been issued. Okay. Okay, um, uh, Dr. Emeka, um, okay, good. Thanks very much. Maybe we shouldn't really preempt the committee. They've not come up with their reports yet, and we'll probably might be seeing a joint report from uh, the Senate Committee on NDDC and uh, the House of Reps on two. But let me bring you in, Honorable Benjamin. First is the issue of the arrest warrant the House issued against Professor Ponde, the present acting MD of NDDC, and the police you know, who at last, uh, early uh, yesterday, invaded the home of your star witness, uh, Joy Nune, have now issued uh, an arrest warrant. Is the House of Reps, the National Assembly, aware of this? You want to quickly comment on this? Yeah. Um, first of all, let me start with the disruption that took place yesterday. That was a, an action, an, a, an attack on Nigerians, not on Joy Nune. Joy Nune was not coming for her father's property or her father's company to defend it. Joy Nune was coming to defend the taxpayer's money, to say what she knows about the taxpayer's money when she was there as the head of the agency. And somebody somewhere, or a group of persons somewhere, tried to frustrate that, the cause of justice. I think intelligent agencies in the country have a work to do to find out what actually happened and why that harassment came into place. And why has the National Assembly, the House of Representatives, not issued a statement to that effect? We did. Okay. Yesterday, the chairman, in the course of his address, mentioned that a star witness was being delayed. Mm. The speaker, all of them made effort to make sure that 
nothing happened to her. She was not coming for the House of Representatives. She was coming for Nigerians. And we totally condemn it. And we are calling Mr. President. To, Mr. President knows the integrity of Joy Nune because Joy Nune is not new to Mr. President. As far back as 2003 or 2010, they've been working together. You know, so she's not somebody that is new that Mr. President will start gazing, you know, about high integrity. That I'm sure. So let Mr. President find out what happened there. But we were affected, actually, because it made us now to innovate and embrace technology. That is the beauty yeah, of yeah. So, COVID-19. So, yeah, COVID-19, one of the benefits of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. We now, you know, activated the uh, projection. Virtual, uh, know, and then virtual uh, interview was done. And she was able to say all that she needed to see, say if she came, you know, in person. Now, on the issue of the uh, Professor Ponde, Professor Ponde mm -hmm. who came and left, and the motion was moved, that motion was in order, in line with section 89, subsection 1, paragraph C and D of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, that if you are invited, if you are summoned, and you did not appear as you're supposed to without a sufficient excuse that is acceptable by the committee or the house it must be satisfactory so you for example you appear and you say i don't like your face i will not take your cross-examination and you walk away definitely the house will not be impressed with the excuse you have given but like joy nune who could not appear yet because she was summoned she could not appear but she placed a call to me as the spokesperson of the house place a call to the speaker, place a call to the uh, chairman of the uh, committee, and give her a reason. And say, I am not there because I am restricted. My movement has been restricted. That is satisfactory. We now gave her a second option. And she was mandated to take that option, and she took it, even though she was psychologically traumatized. Now, what did we do? Because this parliament is the people's parliament that is sensitive, that doesn't want to appear as, you know, arrogant and uh, personal attack on the, uh, on the, on the MD of the IMC. The leadership of the parliament today came up with a new motion asking us to allow him to come again on Monday. We did not, I move an objection for us to rescind the first motion which was to arrest him. But that motion did not pass through because the leadership of the house said let that motion stay as it is. The resolution stays as it is, but offer him an oppor opportunity to come in on Monday. Because if we did not move this motion today to summon him, it means if the warrant of arrest had been issued today by the speaker, within the weekend, he could be arrested. But because of the new motion, summoning him on Monday, he's free till Monday. But if by Monday he comes and behaves in like manner, then we can activate Section 89, which was where we base our first motion. All right, thanks so very much, uh, Benjamin uh, Kalu, the spokesman of the House of Representatives and a member of the committee on NDDC, uh, which is having an ongoing public hearing. Thanks for coming on the arrival. Thank you very much for inviting me. Let me, me. say uh, a big appreciation too to. Um, our guest, Dr. Emeka Okengu, in our off-site uh, studios uh, for coming on the program. So happy, man. Well, that's it for this edition of the Arise interview. Do remember to join us again tomorrow from me and the entire team here in Abuja. Goodbye and thanks for watching.